ability that TL is not able to play this carry versus carry top lane style where they have struggled at times. We got to see what the drafts are going to give us. And talking to some of the players and staff members, they think this is going to be a lot more interesting I've been <laughs> than a 3-0. FlyQuest have been looking very strong recently, while Team Liquid ended the split with quite a few losses. Let's get into it, though. Lissandra, uh, one of the bands right off the table here from Poe Belter. This guy has been doing so much work for FlyQuest, roaming around, setting up teammates, uh, and really playing well. Yeah, as you mentioned, we did get to see Poe Belter just last weekend. They played Golden Guardians, 3-2 victory there, but it means that what they wanted to play was shown. It gives Team Liquid the early scouting edge. We haven't seen TL play a 9.6 yet, but we saw FlyQuest tested all the way to Game 5 in that kind of context. So that's going to be, I think, a little bit helpful on the ban phase. We're seeing Gangplank and Silas dropped away from Impact, giving him the ability to play this game. Oh. And Controversial pick here yeah? uh, for Team Liquid that they're, they're hovering waiting. over. It's a possibility. But the question I really have with Team Liquid is, as you'd kind of mentioned, the three-game loss streak heading into playoffs, how much of that is really indicative of their level of play? How much of that was being a bit lax, as Kane talked about with Avli this morning? That's the question that I have here. And I mean, some people were saying, people who were, you know, the Team Liquid kind of supporters saying that, oh, well, they already locked in first, so of course they're going to experiment, of course they're going to do these different things. The Jace was one of those experimentations that wasn't really working out as well for them. Uh, so seriously, if this is that that kind of play style that they want to show, we'll see if Impact can deliver a better level here today against Viper, who is such an excellent carry versus carry top laner. I kind of like opening with the Jace pick uh, because similar to yesterday, where you open with the Taric Sona bottom lane, then if it does work in game one, then you can receive some more respect, some bans. Uh, looking forward throughout the series. But if it flops on his exactly. base, you know, then it's that, still gotta work. <laughs> that's right out the window. <laughs> well, Centaurin back on the rec side. He played so well last week. Gonna grab that one, no problem. Team Liquid's it's time to round out the rest of their composition. Uh, increasingly, we've been seeing bot lane picks later and later on in the draft. They're no longer quite those same safe blinds. And oh, there's oh. the Zona, and there's the Taric Team Liquid ready to go in game one. We saw it yesterday. Cloud9 pulled out in game number one to get a win over TSM. TSM talked about how they were not ready for that, and they just banded out the rest of the series. But again, if you can get a win in the first game like this, that can earn you some extra credit for the bands later in the series. It does have to work though. And they are blind picking this bottom lane. Uh, yeah, actually they're not. Galio's already been locked in, not too threatening of a support. Yeah, there's a small chance that Galio gets flexed mid and you know, yeah. really goes top, but very likely will be JJ playing that Galio. And I've been hearing you know, a lot of discussion from pros about the fact that they feel you can pick extremely kind of, so to speak, greedy scaling ADs into this bot lane because they don't feel that in pro play they should be able to punish you heavily in lane. Things along the lines of Kog'Maw and Jinx, they feel that you can get away with and then just have superior DPS when you do come to that late game if you can survive to that point. Yeah, we saw Sven in Smoothie. They took the vein into it, got the early kill in lane uh, with the Condemn against the wall on the Sona who is squishy and susceptible to burst. And one of the big things yesterday with the composition that Cloud9 ran when they did have the Sona Terek was this Hecarim. Sven Skirin had such a strong game on the Hecarim. He was multiple levels ahead of his opposing jungler. He had the hard engage with that champion to pair up with Terek, and it really did kind of bring the composition together. So I'm interested to see, will TL draft some of that hard engage? Because Terek Ultimate, I feel, is so much harder to use defensively than it is offensively when you have that guaranteed engage and you're forcing them to fight you into it. And watching these team comps play out, it does feel like any of these Sona Terek comps are very mid-game focused. When we had Sven Skarin pop off, it was Warrior Trinity for a second, right? It's a very mid-game spike champion. Sona can get to Archangel Staff and a Lich Bane, but she'll start to fall off from there. She's not gonna have the same late game impact as a five item Ezreal or Jinx or Sivir or Kais in this kind of case. So a scaling mark from the bottom lane, if FlyQuest can withstand the three item spike and mid-game push, it can start to feel better for them, but you have to get through that against infinite sustain. And you are also com combining that with the Jace. Early lethality, Jace is gonna have a similar curve there and a different damage type of a threat. So Team Liquid are putting together a very strong uh, mid game for themselves here. And that's why the laning phase becomes so critical, right? You know, if you're gonna draft for this Jace, for this Olaf, the Sonic Terek, you're gonna have a really effective early few levels, early mid game. Ooh, this is probably a Jace it. mid, yeah. But Jace mid, cannon top, Olaf, maybe even attack damage Olaf in the jungle. Yeah, yeah, I mean, very, very likely could be, you know, Black Cleaver sort of style. Uh, I do think that Olaf pairs very well with the Terek. You send him in with your ultimate, and you can use the Dazzle off of him with the Bastion. 
hitting those stuns, giving the additional CC for the Olaf, who is going to be really powerful uh, in those early minutes of the game. Both the Sona speed and the Jace acceleration gate work very well for Olaf and Kennen as engagers for the team too. On the side of FlyQuest though, they have also locked in the Zoe for Po Belter, his game five winning champion, where he absolutely hard carried for FlyQuest to get them here today. He's on this once again. They have once again flexed the Aurelia up to Viper, who talked about not even having that many recent games on Aurelia, but having the confidence to play that flex for the team, and it worked out incredibly well. Now, Aurelia versus Ken and Toplin is one of the things people looked at as a possibility to help the FlyQuest upset happen. Get the carry carry matchup, let Viper hopefully win with experience in this kind of champion with a bit of aptitude on this kind of champion. And we'll see if they can withstand the mid-game spikes and if they can get into the late game. And Wild Turtle can do the late game carrying that he had been doing throughout the back half of the split. It's time for the coach to shake hands. Invert always incredibly stylish. <laughs> That's Here true. we go. Team Liquid were the favorites coming into the year. And for the first 15 games, you thought this is definitely the squad, a 14 and one start, but then a three game losing streak. Jensen, Doublelift, Core JJ, absolute juggernauts in their roles. And FlyQuest with a rookie top laner and a few new additions as well have managed to make top four. And it's time for the battle to join TSM in St. Louis. Who's gonna make it through this best of five? Summoner's Rift, here we are, and how fashionable does Tarek look leaving the fountain? <laughs> Another Sona Tarek bot lane here in the LCS, undefeated in the playoffs, and Team Liquid already showing a little bit of something new, even though it's been seen before, as FlyQuest are gonna hope that Viper on Comfort and Wild Turtle the same can make another best of five series win. Big TL fans, though, gonna have some questions. You know, is this the draft that you were expecting to see from TL? Doublelift has not had the best history on mages in the bot lane. This is more similar to that style. Impact, not the guy you usually wanna see on carries, but here's an invade. A double stun, JJ's gotta run away, but the core is already there to do some damage. Looking for two more shots to kill him. Will he have to burn the flash? Someone to heal might be enough. Oh. Will there be the extra auto attacks? Impact coming in to try to help out as well. Flashing over the wall, flashing to follow. Two autos should be enough, and it is! Impact starts out strong in the top lane. They get another flash as well. Poe Belter has to use the real flash on Zoe to escape from the bottom side. And that is Team Liquid already securing first blood for their top laner. Impact on Kennen now is going to have the extra money to get more aggressive. I, yeah, I think FlyQuest made the read that it was a five-man invade on TL on the top side to try to get wards up there. And, you know, they saw some members of TL on the top side. So JJ and Turtle think it's safe to walk in here on the bottom side and get those wards down. But Jace, as well as Tarek, waiting there and landing the double Bastion. Yeah, running into the Tarek stun here, they're able to land the double. JJ taking way too much damage there. The rest of Team Liquid are here to help corral him. Impact flashing over the wall. Now, flashes expended here are going to need to be tracked by the junglers. Impact is ahead on Kennen. And in the range matchup, you want to try and threaten. But without that flash, you have to be so cognizant of where is Santorin. Rek'Sai, a very potent ganker early on, can go for those flash uh, plays. And so that is why Impact right now is actually letting the minion wave sit in the middle. And speaking of Impact, he did not get time to recall. So the first blood does not affect the landing phase right now. No extra items brought in here for the fight. So it will still be a fairly straight up 1v1. And again, as you mentioned, flash down, despite getting first blood, impact technically a bit behind. Yeah, I think he's gonna have to hold on to that lightning rush, use it pretty defensively. You know, when you are in these awkward positions, you wanna make sure that you're not using it too aggressively because if the jungler shows up, you have no flash, you have no lightning rush, you are gonna be so susceptible to going down. That's still hoping to harass with the Mancy and Centaur's gonna sweep the wards, make sure that, okay, impact does indeed have to play with Fog of War here. And Centaur should know that when he goes for the Scuttle, he'll probably be by the Scuttle Crab Ward. Uh, that is so common uh, by all teams on both of them. So he'll know that he's been scouted. If you 
do avoid all those wards though, Rek'Sai can actually go much more deep into enemy territory and come from behind laners, even on the top side. Not gonna be the case though, as he's been scouted and will go back to the jungle to finish clearing. Still gonna be a camp and a half behind this Olaf right now. Xfinity has knocked down six himself, still has a scuttle to take. Instead, cleared all of his normal camps, grabs the red smite, and he'll be ready to go back on the map. Two control wards, first recall. I know from solo queue, I've never seen that happen from my junglers, Kobe. Don't if you've done that either, but it is a vision focused here for Xmithy. Yeah, he goes for the power clear on Olaf, just getting all the camps down this early. Then you go out for uh, some vision work, and you come back to your jungle starting at that top again. They will all be respawning in line at higher experience, and you get to continue your power clearing. It's actually one of the fastest routes to level six. Uh, and you have a little bit of time here while you're waiting for them to respawn to go get some invade done. Another really kind of interesting thing about this Sonoteric bottom lane is the access to double side stones as you're going further into the game. You know, when you talk about mid game and that being a lot of the power around that, you can play even more effectively around objectives like the early Barons because you have two people to heal you through the damage coming out of the Baron, but also because you have such a plethora of vision uh, to actually be able to set up and, and kind of secure those objectives. That'll be something we see soon enough, as you're seeing, of course, it is Courtney Day taking all the normal farm as they wait for Doublelift to finish his quest. And then once that's done, Sona goes to back and getting all of the gold. Now, when we saw the C9 TSM game, actually, it was the Tarek uh, losing a lot of farm up to the pushing of Sven and Smoothie. In this case, Turtle and Core JJ, or sorry, uh, Turtle and JJ, I'm gonna get that wrong all series, uh, have not punished Tarek's farm. And he's actually last hitting just as well as the Kai'Sa. Yeah, and it's much more difficult when you have a melee champion at your side to try and punish the uh, Tarek Sona lane. So that's why they were so confident to lock this in after seeing the Galio early. You can see though how this lane can win through poke, right? You know, Doublelift is gonna be able to focus almost solely on just poking and harassing. He doesn't have to actually farm. So you're playing this Sona and every time Turtle is actually going for farm, you can be threatening to step forward and, and landing that poke. And as a result, Turtle has already expended his potion and is sitting about two thirds HP. Staying back as best he can. Nice little taunt. Core JJ mostly actually shields it all with Bastion anyway. Not going to lose too much there, but looks like he'll stay safe for now as Doublelift gets 14 gold and can walk back to safety. And this lane really is going to be frustrating to play against if they can get you into those sort of poke battles because not only is there Bastion shield, there's Guardian. Both of these champions can heal. Sona W also adds a shield during the trades. Uh, it is one of those things where when you're choosing fights against it as the FlyQuest lineup, you have to be sure that you're going to be able to have essentially that lethal damage that you can actually fully finish them off or they will start to heal up and sustain through those fights and really can look to turn things around. Just looking by the ward is the Olaf of Xmithy and oftentimes you feel safe when you have that trinket down because you think it sees them and it oh. doesn't. In fact, there is JJ though, spots him. Infernal Rick doesn't slow, an easy walk out for the Olaf, but that's really unfortunate. Committed the control ward and everything and won't get the Drake. Yeah, gotta be a little bit more sneaky. It's something like a blast cone over the top or something. JJ wraps around, does find it out, so there'll be no sneaky dragons early on. Santorin just cruising back to the top side to continue farming here. And no rewards for the early play. And speaking of rewards, make sure you're logged in to watch.lollysports.com so that for the entire series, you can earn rewards for watching those games. Make sure you're logged in, watch the games. You can even still turn on Twitch chat. It's perfect. Incredible. Yep. And in the top lane, we do now know that it's going to be an AP cannon. Very likely the revolver has come through. We did see yesterday actually a gunblade build coming out on the cannon, uh, which I believe to be pretty atypical. It almost always is a, a protobelt rush if you're going to go for that AP or sort of more hybrid build. Uh, and that, I think, is what would make the most sense with this sort of composition when you're talking about mid-game focus, when you're talking about forcing team fights, protobelt, AP, dive in there. Getting all that damage down, I think, makes a lot of sense, and that's the value one. Yeah, I liked the Gunblade a lot more, specifically versus the Gangplank matchup. Aurelia here, uh, in fact, is going to be a bit worried about the all-in. Aurelia now, post-level 6, has a Rek'Sai as the jungle. So for FlyQuest side, this is one of the big areas you want to look at, is the solo lanes here. Pobelter on the Zoe, he has been great at taking over games, if you could get him an early lead. And Viper on the Aurelia, this new guy, rookie of the split for FlyQuest, is on one of those carry champions in the top side. And while he's back in. up. 0.25 seconds at work. Zoe Q cooldown nerfs prevent a second paddle star from landing. And Jensen's able to keep playing the landing phase. I heard that cheer for the Zoe Q nerf. 
I hear you, audience. Flowers is cheering at home as well. Yeah, yeah. Now he's like, it's not enough. He's still <laughs> mad about it. All right, Santorin does have flash, so it's a possibility here. But again, it's double level sixes for the supports. They have Taric ultimate. They have Sona ultimate for disengage here. Uh, let's see what can get done. And Smithy may be spotted by this board over by the Raptor, so that could give him a little bit more confidence to actually commit to it. But with him clearing down towards the bot side, it feels like a pretty small window to actually try to go for it. And doesn't feel like they're comfortable to commit. Yeah. Uh, I'd also say for FlyQuest, because uh, of kind of the nature of how the competitions interact, they are not the ones who really need to force. If you're just happy to farm it out, then great. You know, FlyQuest, I think, is going to be very comfortable to opt into that sort of a situation. That being said, I don't think Tim Li Team Liquid are up against the timer no, quite yet. yet. Yeah, they're looking at the mid game. They've got like 20 good minutes <laughs> left in them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to set up for that Baron. You're going to take a fight around like the second or third Drake, and that's where it really starts turning around. And First bit of lethality come through. Protobalt done for impact as well. That's free wave through when he wants it. As items keep stacking up, Turtle is also doing the uh, more frequent uh, nowadays build of Kaisa, which is Stormraiser first. Now to get to those power spikes and the evolves early on. Gone are the days of BF little pickaxe, though I think it's still viable. As the wave is cleared, the Rek'Sai was near top, but Centaur not going to pull the gank. Yeah, I think it was more kind of holding around, waiting for a possible move from x Smithy. Whenever you see a big minion wave uh, you know, being built up, you have to guard against possible uh, movements from the enemy team. Not going to be the case. Infernal Drake is available. Control wards have been laid. But JJ keeps his watch over the Drake. <laughs> yeah, he's keeping a close eye on it. But you know, as the side zones are now completing for the TL bot lane, you know, Doublelift is ready. Core JJ is almost ready. It gets not only much more difficult to actually ever really try to gank them, but an all-in top lane. Pretty good damage here. Going to put impact the half HP Viper. Can keep putting in for attacks, but we need several Qs and no reset left. Can't go over any farther. Still decent damage and trades the ultimates out. Nice blue buff taken over by Smithy as they get the bot scuttle as well. And now as those items come through bot lane, they start feeling more comfortable. That top fight was actually important though, because Viper has such a big health lead now. There's no sustain on impact. Even though they both have teleports, it's much more risky uh, for impact to leave. Viper gets control of the minion wave. He also has uh, priority in lane, and that can dissuade Team Liquid from actually making that Infernal Drake play. Really does help out where the bottom lane, they were just getting invaded for FlyQuest, and they were having a little bit of trouble. And I think I'd even argue that the Kennen ult is probably more important for them to have at that Dragon fight than the Aurelia ult, right? So that is, you know, another kind of beneficial trade there. You can see that the gold is very even between the bot carries, but look at the gold between the supports. Oh, and another all in. Oh! Oh! Impact gets the stun and flashes in time. A single auto attack. Attack separate and impact from he death. He cannot walk back up there. He started to walk back to turret. He's got flash cute and just die. Yeah, Viper doing very well for himself, flexing on the top side here against impact, a veteran in the league. Aurelia taking control. Meanwhile, Poe Belter doesn't have much mana left, but he's gonna get the auto attack off. Yeah, I mean, it's I it's that. Impact with the range versus melee matchup. It's Impact who started with first blood, and it's him being pushed out of the lane by Viper. This was certainly one of the ways in that a lot of people were talking about for FlyQuest is through this top lane, through advantages that they could establish there. And again, they win some momentum on the top side. They turn it into Infernal Drake here. They finish it up, and that is FlyQuest with some extra scaling for later. Keep in mind that Team Liquid still have a sizable gold lead off of the first blood and off of the farm. You have to keep in mind that about a thousand of that gold lead is specifically the Taric versus Galio matchup. That sometimes doesn't mean quite as much. It really depends what comes through here. And I would say one of the reasons why people opt into the Sona Taric specifically for the double support bottom lane is that Taric does have decent scaling yeah. for team fighting for uh, the way that they're looking to play through the mid game. And that can be, uh, you know, another area where uh, they do kind of rely on. Definitely. I mean, it's certainly not a Kai'Sa with the extra 1k gold, <laughs> sure, but, yeah. but if you get an early redemption and you're looking at mid-game focused team fights, that redemption certainly can be the difference between winning and losing that fight. And it's all I feel like against these sort of competitions with Zona Taric about hitting the damage threshold where you're doing enough damage that they can no longer prevent the death, you know, land all of those heals and keep yourself alive. This is actually really interesting. He went for a Catalyst, so it may actually be an Abyssal, Abyssal. Mask here. Yeah. Uh, just to kind of buff up some of his, his teammates' damage. And it's a kind of item you never get to buy in a regular game of League of Legends, but it's AP Sona, it's AP Ken, and it's a damage amp for the squad, and it'll spike 
you know, well in time for Baron, well in time for second Drake, and that's when you want that power. One of the cool things about this, too, is so much of the power in Tarek is, is tied into the passive. But because you're normally very squishy since you're so low income, it's actually pretty difficult to get those auto attacks off in a team fight. If you have an Abyssal Mask, if you're really tanky early on, you can use that passive constantly, reset your heals, reset the Dazzle stuns, and have that much more power in a team fight. And to look at from the other side here for FlyQuest, they're looking to avoid those big groupings in the mid game. They have Viper on the Aurelia, very good in a 1v1 up on the side, uh, in a side lane. They have Galio that can traverse a great distance across Summoner's Rift. And of course, Poe Belter with the Zoe, always looking to pick people off while they're away from teammates, when they're uh, going between lanes here. So FlyQuest looking to spread the map much more and avoid the giant Team Liquid grouping here towards the mid-game. And that's what you kind of have to see. How is Teal going to force them to come to them, right? We saw you know, yesterday in the C9 game, around 20 minutes, they just started grouping, walking everywhere as a five-man squad, trying to force their opponents to respond. And as of yet, TL certainly have not been the ones to force. It was actually FlyQuest taking that dragon. And not too, too much does come from the rift. Yeah, in fact, none of the gold was gained. Speaking of being forced, Smith, he couldn't walk into local gold range of those plates. So the, the plates fall. No one gains the money, only the turret damage. And now the dive towards the back line. Turtle dodges the stun, finds a knockup towards the Taric, but he's invulnerable. Ult for ult, two to one in this case, and out goes Team Liquid. Yeah, a couple of ults traded. And I really like that you point that out, uh, Freak. I was going to mention, you have to be in range when the Rift Herald is popped, or else it feels so bad because you're actually just losing out on these plates that are getting destroyed there, and you don't get that very valuable income. Still, though, Team Liquid, four plates taken here before the 14-minute mark, contributing to their gold lead uh, that they have running into yeah. the mid-game, which is where they want to focus on. It at least contributes to map control. Those turrets a little bit more injured for when round two comes. They go for bigger pushes. You think back to Cloud9 versus TSM, an amazing series from yesterday, and it was through a mid-game team fight that C9 sustained back up and just kept pushing and kept pushing. Devilif has his Archangel staff done, cheaper spells, lots of mana, and as Cloudrake spawns in 80 seconds, that'll probably be a target of their attention. And, and you really can, you know, when the Baron is coming up, sit on the Baron almost infinitely because Tarek is nonstop resetting using the passive. He can heal just about every global, it feels like, you know, with that Tarek heal. Sona is healing, healing you up. So you can sit on that and bait those objectives, hold on to those objectives much longer than a normal team. That's a really awkward oh, oh, into He's it. gonna have to cleanse, he's gonna have to cleanse, pops it. Here comes Rex, this could be more of a fight. Jumps back around for a slow, nice jump back as well. Going for round two, the flash knockup, and that's the first kill of the series for FlyQuest. Santori does not give up on the chase. They find the kill on to Jensen here. Throughout the entire jungle, they run almost into the secondary turrets, and they finally take him down. Nice stuff right there. Brings the gold a bit close within 2,000 here, as they've already got that Infernal Drake as well. And FlagQuest hoping to keep this series close, hoping to win it as well. Would be an upset, but they're looking pretty good right now. Jensen's a guy that we usually compliment so much on his fancy footwork, uh, but barely tagged the end of the bubble there, cleansing uh, and trying to get out of it. Let's take a look at the entire run, because this went from river all the way to tier two turret. Yeah, it looked like he was trying to flash over the full bubble, but just wasn't quite able to get it. Using Ooh. the two of the skies to gain a bit more distance from Santorin does land the knockup, but then flash knockup comes through from Santorin, setting up for the paddle star from Pobelter, and not enough TL members there in time to bail him out. Well, nice stuff there in that fight. We still look at top lane being advantage for Viper as well. As we have Kennen walking back to lane, both players have teleport if the play needs to be had. Tarek almost has ultimate back up. Shouldn't be a fight until that happens. JJ in a similar state on the Galio. They can press R soon enough. This is Cloud Drake is alive. And with the 2019 changes, first Drake's pretty good. 3% move speed even in combat. Definitely true. And a lot of the key items are coming down. You constantly need to check inventories for things like stopwatches. The Kennen, a very important stopwatch to keep track of. Impact is full health, has both summoners. Could join a possible skirmish on the bottom side. And both junglers are here. Got a lump coming down. Here comes the first knockup. Nice little stun towards JJ, though, as well. And here comes the teleports. Impact to join this one. This could be big. Stopwatch pop, but JJ certainly going to die. He's going to taunt. He's still going to go down. Impact has both the kills now for Team Liquid, and it's time to go for the Drake. That should be an easy Drake for Team Liquid because FlyQuest have opted to keep Viper on the top side. So FlyQuest will push on the top side towards the turret, and Team Liquid are actually getting turret damage here to try and get first turret gold first. 
Yeah, and they Probably should be able to they should be able to get it very easily, honestly, with three members down here. Turret plating has already fallen, so there's not those additional defensive stats as you do knock them down in a group. They'll be able to take the turret, they'll be able to take the dragon as well. And it looked like JJ ha had a bit of a mis-execution there. As he came out of the bush, he let his taunt go, and I'm not sure if that was something where he was charging up and preparing to flash in and then you know, they didn't have the play ready, but he essentially walked into TL without Taunt even available. So nothing really for him to do there. And FlyQuest will be able to trade back turret on the top side. All of that gold is going to go into Viper's pockets, which is going to feel pretty good when you're trying to spread the map, when you're trying to avoid this TL squad, you want side lane advantage. Especially when they have the teleport advantage now. Aurelia does have Trinity Force completed, so that kill threat is there. Let's take another look at it. Let's see. Uh, JJ, as you're mentioning, in the brush here. Yeah, I think uh, I think he just tried to bail out on it. Maybe he was considering going for a flash taunt, but then hesitated or decided they couldn't go for it. But when you're stepping forward without that taunt, you have little to no threat on the Galio and essentially makes it that one-way trip. Well, down he goes, and it means that second kill on the board. First turret, only worth 150 bonus gold, but it's still money in the pockets, and Team Liquid still sit at about 2,000 gold up with one Drake apiece. We talked about it being a mid-game composition. They're still growing for now. They have not passed their point of usefulness as Doublelift has got his sheen. He's getting closer and closer to Lich Bane. That's going to be nice. Second lethality item coming in soon for Jensen. And Abyssal Mask very near for Core JJ. So the next spike's coming soon. It'll be right in time for Baron. Yeah, they certainly have not passed you know, their powerful point, but I would say that they need to get a lot of work done in this next 10 minutes. I think that yeah. is really their window. You know, if you arrive at 30 minutes and the game is sitting like this, you're thinking FlyQuest is going to be able to win it. And I think this is really where we're going to be finding the first true test for TL. They're showing us a new composition here. They're showing us double if not on a marksman. This is not a, a scale to late game and depend on, on your star player style of team uh, in this game. And a lot of things they're going to be looking for. Flanks engages here for the Cannon Ultimate. Speed ups with Jason Sona. Will they be able to get the Olaf, the Cannon, into place to try and attack FlyQuest uh, and get that backline down? Meanwhile, FlyQuest need to control the vision. Not only does it deny those flanks, but it could set up Poe Belter to find picks. This is sort of where this all hinges now. Is it's 20 minutes in, there's no Drake alive, it is only Baron. This is really where everything is made and everything is broken. Team Liquid gonna be the ones with the more power right now, but they will fall off over time as Kaisa scales. So it's the setup for this top set of the map, the setup for Baron. You're seeing the teleport users already running around. Viper is now bottom lane. TP is up. Trinity Force is complete. Merc Treads help him survive Impact 1v1. And this is now the setup to play. And I generally find that the later the game goes, the worse it gets in the 1v1 for the Kennen. You know, especially as an AP Kennen, you essentially have to have enough burst to threaten a, a 100 to 0 style of fight against the Aurelia. And Aurelia is not building magic resistance, really, but it is your, a situation where you're going to build a lot of HP and you're going to get past that threshold. And you will always win the long extended fight against an AP Kennen once you hit that, where you have your Sterics and you have your Titanic and your Triforce and all these items. He just can't burst you down. And I feel like even after you have Tree Force and Merc Treads, you're good to go for the Aurelia. Viper definitely very threatening down there. Meanwhile, on the top side, they found in, uh, Jensen. That's at least 30 seconds bot. Jensen burns the flash. He's got that to get away. Kaisa's gonna chase in. Couple more auto attacks. This should be oh. enough. The Q's gonna land from Santorin as well. That's a kill picked up. Not quite the ton of the core JJ. Tia looking to go back forward though. Double stun landed. Damage to the core JJ. Uh, sorry, uh, the Galio of JJ, and he's gonna get out. FlyQuest make a big play on the opposite side of the map. Picking off the split pusher here. Jensen going down on Jace is going to put a stop to the role they're trying to put together. Yeah, and it's more time bought for FlyQuest. They're doing, honestly, an excellent job moving around here. Feels like they are being the more proactive, more aggressive team so far this game. Being able to look for these plays, and with Turtle closing in on the Rage Blade, such a strong point in the game is approaching for this Kai'Sa. FlyQuest have done so much work this split. Adding Poe Belter and Turtle's experience here with Santorin coming back and the new rookie, Viper, in the top side, all playing very well, showcasing some teamwork here. See if it can work out versus the veterans. I mean, this is Poe Belter against his old team, against the mid laner who was brought in to replace him. Poe Belter won back-to-back -back championships with this squad and then got, was shown the door, right? And, and certainly you want to take down that team. You want to prove that they made the wrong decision, that you know, with this kind of band of upstarts, so to speak, you could take down the yep. TL team, who is who is made of world champions, who is made of superstars, and 
millions of dollars. Back-to-back -back yes. defending champions, Team Liquid, but FlyQuest looking to put a stop to that one. I really do love the, the story of the FlyQuest veterans, though, because these players have titles, but they were never the ones who were like, oh, they won because of you, Fobelter and Santor and a Wild Turtle. Though you've got, like, eight trophies among you, it's not because of you. It's, well, you were on the team, and you've got a bunch of ex-LCS champions here to say, no, 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 we can do it with ourselves with a rookie top laner and uh, a one-year journeyman support here pulled up from the Academy League. And so far, FlyQuest holding on very well, but Team Liquid pick up the Drake, and they are still ready to go. Oh. Oh, oh, the taunt. Nice try. <laughs> oh, popping spell thief there for the extra boost. He dodges out of the taunting double lift. I especially like that this is Pobelter and double yep. lift exchanging in-game taunts because they have been very active on social media as well. Uh -huh. But Impact does get a turret during that time. Pobelter trying to hold them off mid. Looking for a bit of poke, finds a sleep, but the Q won't get much damage, but he takes it up anyway. And the siege continues. This is really what this comp does. Oh, the Infinite play. Health, lots of poke. Here comes the play. A knock up in. Galio as well. Can they knock down one? They've gotten the first kill out of Sona. Devil is gone. In goes the cannon. Looks for turning it around, but not just yet. Viper is online for the double kill. Looks for number three. Can't find it just yet, but he might get it there. That three for Viper in his first play. As he's already won one series. Looking for another. Looking for kill number four. They found the stun, and it is a quadra kill for Aurelia, and the fifth is picked up. The ace picked up for Poe Belter. And it is rookie of the split Viper with the deep teleport behind Team Wicklid lines. Comes in, gets the quadra kill, secures the bear for the team. FlyQuest are off to the races. That was incredible from FlyQuest. The ace on TL when TL is supposed to be strongest. Impact unable to catch oh. anyone with that cannon. And the Aurelia tearing through the entire team. Quadra kill, ace into Baron. Let's watch it one more time. Here's the TP at the bottom of your screen coming in. And it is the engage initially from FlyQuest, but Impact is gonna come around on the right side with the cannon. You think he may be able to catch the carries of FlyQuest, but he's not able to get on top of anyone. Santorin leads the charge, sacrifices himself, tunnels in on Rek'Sai, gets the good Galio placement, and then knock up on the double lift to burn the Sona Flash. Then Viper comes in, finishes off the kill. They destroy the back line and just steamroll Team Liquid. Oh. <laughs> Uses his own flash, but also to guarantee the last kill comes through. And you gotta know Viper is hatched about that one. That's his current mind state. That's the live shot of Viper while playing League of Legends. At 25 minutes in, feeling pretty good about this one now. 4-0 on Aurelia. It's the focus you can see in these guys, right? They are not getting hyped up yet. They know there's so much work to do, not only to win the series, but to win this game still. And they are staying laser focused here, wanting to close out this first game against TL. The ball is certainly in FlyQuest's court. TL is approaching kind of that 30 minute mark where you start to feel like this composition is gonna be falling off. We'll see if they can get something major done in the next couple minutes. Baron buff on for FlyQuest, keeping the pressure on the mid lane here. Outer turret should be taken down. They just buff up the cannon minion. Pobelts are going for poke and they protect the minion wave. It will do the work for them. It's it down to about one third of slow lands from Olaf. It's 50 recollects the axe, hit turtle again, but He's gonna feel fairly safe and they're gonna be just fine. Aurelia and Cannon meet in the bottom lane as they wait for the middle lane to be cleared out as well. So far, no major scraps being done, but the next push is in. Baron's still on for 90 seconds. And with the Cannon right here, this could be enough for Poke lands. Jensen at half HP. Galio joins in for a bit as well, and the health bars get lower and lower on that turret. Remember though, the poke doesn't really matter. It's just about the turret because Tarek and Sona can sustain you forever, so they need to attack the health of the turret. They need to push them forward, and that is exactly what they are doing here. DL straight back to full, but Viper is pressing on that bottom side, and the clock is working against Team Liquid. All right, three to three now in turrets, and you're right, Team Liquid probably have to wait that minute for Baron to fall, but then not wait too long that we get to four item Kaisa. Look at the damage out of Pobelter. What a great crescendo. They found their opportunity. Double Lift sets it up and Jensen knocks it down. Double Lift able to get him back for the taunt earlier here. Smithy is on the chase. Olaf going strong. Got Axe is not going to find the first one, but now hasted by Sona could find the second. Nice blast come by some space as the bottom turret falls as the team joins up and he's going to take the empowered recall. So long term a kill for a turret. That's an okay trade there as the Baron ticks down. One of the things to always look for when punishing Zoe, Zoe gets really annoying when going for all this poke, constantly using her R, is 
when she uses it, she'll go right back to the point of origin there. Double if walks up, throws the Sona ultimate down right on that dupe, and he's going to be able to lock him in place. Yeah, they did get the poke down. It does come on this next star. Stepping forward here pretty far, and Doublelift is ready and waiting. Nails the stun. The, the ultimate from the Dazzle is going to follow up there, too. Rather, yeah. the stun from Tarek. And at the same time, Viper did take an additional turret on the bot side, so it was the two turrets going the way of FlyQuest. And Viper, in the midst of this, completes a third item. He is now on GA. This guy is monstrously strong. I would really like to see you know, an additional healing debuff kind of picked up, though, on the side of FlyQuest. I do think that you wanted Executioners pretty quickly here on Turtle against this much healing. This is now that next major breaking point. Something known with the Team Liquid squad is they've got to find their way around this next mid-game fight. The Drake is alive, and if you don't fight for this one, what will you fight for? Impact from the half HP. Gets the shield. There's a sleep coming forward. Going to find a little bit of damage. No, not going to find Core JJ. Both are backed off. Crescendo's available. The ultimates all are right here as the Drake is now started. FlyQuest. Have to examine their battle lines. Look for the poke. Not going to find this one just yet. Down goes the mountain drake. Picked up there by Wild Turtle. Will there be an engage? Drowsy on the one. A little bit of damage. Not going to find much of a stub. And now the re-engage. Looking to burn him down. And JJ's going to drop. And here comes the re-engage. They're fast. They're furious. They were invulnerable. And the chase is in. Looking to find that second kill. Kid is going to help for this one. And they're going to look to chase down Pobelter as well. As Impact chases in. There's the death of the Santorin. Pobelter going to drop as well. Three for zero to Team Lick. And a Wild Turtle has nowhere to go. Yeah, he's just gonna get chased on down. He does alt out, but Smithy is behind him. There is no escape. And Core JJ decided that fight with a single stun. He stuns JJ immediately as he came in, shutting down the Galio. He couldn't even proc the aftershock, couldn't even get a taunt off before he went down. And just like that, Team Liquid are on the inhibitor turrets. They are running it right back to FlyQuest base. 20 seconds in the major response. Inhibitor itself is a guarantee. There's a chance they even look for the Nexus itself. They're cheating a bit forward, and they're winning around. They they're trying to, to, end. to at least get turrets, if not end the game. You can see these three minions must be cleared. Viper tries a bit. The turret's down low. Galio engages. Three versus five. And turn it around. Santorin comes in, buys a bit of space, trying to run away. He's going to get back to the fountain. But the new wave is there, but the response come in. One turret drops. FlyQuest stay alive. Woo, FlyQuest are able to defend, and and they keep Team Liquid off of the Nexus turrets. Very close there and using some flashes, but they're not done yet. Teleport for Viper. He can revive. He can look for the play. Impact is a bit low. There could be an engage. Galley ult not available. Viper looks for the stun. Not going to find it. Goes in anyway. Doesn't find that either. Liquid slow. Lands. That's a sleep. Olaf's going to ult. They're going to be able to run away from this one with Sona. It should be easy. They're going to walk out. Baron is on the table, but Team Liquid do have a lot of sustain with the double supports here. FlyQuest heading over that way. Double lift is out of mana, though. The double support doesn't matter if you can't cast any spells. Sona is very mana heavy. She stayed on the map for an incredibly long time, and there's no Ocean Drake Dick to reach. And Blue Buff is actually massive for him, but Double has already recalled. It won't really matter in this case. Picked up there by Jensen, who needs mana as well. There's the Drowsy. Olaf is ultless. Not going to find that Paddle Star. Half HP on the Baron. Looking for the re engage. Most ults are available. It's going to be the slight fight picked up there by Santorin, but Team Liquid are invulnerable. Looking for the kills. They're going to get one already. Look for a second. Viper going to force the GA out as Turtle tries to stay alive, kiting away, but goes down to impact. The kills are going back and forth everywhere, but Santorin stays alive. Core JJ in the duel, a triple for the Rex side. Santorin pushes back impact, and now it's Core JJ alone. Just as the Taric, it will be Flagfoot winning the fight. Viper is unstoppable. Five kills in this game. Five kills. We just had five minutes straight of fighting. They were in the base. They're at the bear. They're in mid lane. Now with the recalls, FlyQuest have swung it back in their favor once again. Such a close fight by that Baron. It felt like Kiel might have been able to clean them up after the initial Baron kill. They do secure it here with Santorin, but in goes Impact with the Terra ultimate, dropping his ultimate, but great job by JJ. He peeled Impact completely. The ultimate from Kenan didn't do anything. Exactly. JJ steps up to the front on Galio, zones the entire team. They tank it. This allows on the backside, a lot of work to be done by Viper. With his Guardian Angel, he can get back up, and then they finish off the fight. Impact, the only survivor there for Team Liquid, whereas FlyQuest get two Baron buffs to take home. Oh, those are pretty big pickups there. Good pickup on that Baron. And Grit by Santorin to land that smite. Look at this game, though. 300 gold separates. And keep in mind, FlyQuest base is not looking very good. They're missing an inhibitor. They're missing one of the Nexus turrets as well. 
If people thought this was going to be a one-sided series, they were dead <laughs> wrong because even this first game has been back and forth. Yeah, and FlyQuest is reaching that sort of late game stage that we talked about. This is where it's going to get harder and harder for TL. Kaisa, it now has three items plus the Executioners. Deathcap is quickly coming in here for Pobelter. Viper is already enormous and now building up more magic resistance with the cowl, so he's going to be that much harder to burst down if you do not have the sustained DPS to knock out this Aurelia quickly. He's going to shred through your team. One thing to point out, though, is there are some real tanks on Team Liquid. Core JJ has 139 CS as a support. Frozen Heart and Abyssal Mask are done. Three cheers for supports with gold, by the way. <laughs> he is actually online as a real tank. Let's see if they can bring the team fight together. Remember, Team Liquid have to look for better angles to try and get back to Wild Turtle, back to Pobelter, really threaten those carries that are destroying them. Yeah, but so far, Impact has not been able to find those angles. He has a ton of gold in his pocket. He's got four items. He has his death cap complete, but he has yet to find that big ultimate where he's getting to the back line, where he's on top of Turtle and Pobelter, and that's really what he needs to look for. He needs to look for that big flank for the TP and flying in behind to try to help them close out this game. The assassinations. Locket not far away from Cord from regular JJ. <laughs> One of these days, I'll get it, hopefully before game five. Mountain Drake picked up cleanly. Looks like FlyQuest unwilling to fight for that one. Mountain number two to TL, no problem, as Top Scuttle drops. Will despawn before Baron comes up. Not gonna mean very much for that top river. Bottom inhibitor basically back on this wave. Should be defended. A team look at pushing with double super minions. Could knock it down if they're willing to siege, but they are not. Yeah, they might be able to get the mid turret here out of the pressure from getting that inhibitor down earlier, but that's about it. FlyQuest are able to quickly clean up the rest of the super minions. Talking about items, talking about cleanup. Double death cap is done for Team Liquid. We talked about this comp being very mid-game focused, eventually getting outscaled. I still don't think that has yet happened. Still at 35 minutes, they look all right. And they have some absolutely absurd damage of what a J Shock Blast can do with a Sona and Cannon over the top with their double death caps. A lot of AP there. Still think the clock is slightly ticking away though, and it is still on Liquid to be the aggressors. Waiting two minutes for Baron, probably actually possible as well. Yeah, I think it's so much down to execution at this point. I, I do give the slight advantage, just, you know, composition-wise to FlyQuest at this point in the game, but TL still do have an incredible amount of vision control with double sightstone. They have a lot of pinks in their inventory. They can look to set up around this Baron, and that Baron is still a win condition for the game. There's an open inhibitor on the bottom side. There's only one Nexus for remaining for FlyQuest. That is a way in, and that is a way to close this game out before things get out of control. Yeah, while we have so much uh, anticipation towards where is Impact going to go? Where is the cannon flank going to come from? I have to commend FlyQuest. Santorin and Viper have done such a good job of getting good placement for the Galio ultimate. And that has really uh, constructed their entire team fight and opened up space uh, for a lot of the damage to be done. Important timers to consider. Garden Angel not quite up for Viper, but very soon it will be. It will come up in time for the Baron fight. That's probably when they're actually going to yeah. fight for all of this, but worth remembering that was pop in the previous battle. Team Liquid did have enough damage to kill him, but that item was very, very useful. Not a ton of MR on him yet, though, still in just the Cowl and the Merc Dreads. It's a fairly mage-heavy Team Liquid composition. Yeah, the GA, critically, you know, is coming up now, and also the bottom lane inhibitor has respawned, so there's not going to be that additional passive pressure coming in from Super Minions. But you do see Impact down on that bottom side, wanting to push this wave up, force someone to respond to it, so that TL can make a move on the other side of the map. But it's FlyQuest at that Baron Pit setting up. I think this might be one of the last windows for Team mm -hmm. Liquid where they have a really even footing because Turtle is working towards his Infinity Edge. And this Kai'Sa is outputting tremendous damage. Once that gets completed, oh. big chunk on the double lift though. In about five full. seconds, we back to full. Yeah, there's Tarek, there's Sona, he'll press W again pretty soon. Almost went to the one on Smithy. The bolts are pretty low, or almost tagged, I should say, but not hit there either. And here is Team Liquid now in the Baron Pit, putting the control wards down, getting rid of the FlyQuest vision. Rex side with Tremor Sense makes it a bit easier, but Impact goes forward, finds a Q, finds a Shock, and Pobelter down to one quarter means he might have to recall. Yeah, they don't have the healers on their team. Pobelter losing this health really does matter, and 
Tail trying to land this poke with this lethality. Jace, they're trying to shove people out. They're trying to get advantage around this area, and they do have control of mid lane for now, but I think they're going to retreat back to the Baron. Yeah, I think this is incredibly important timing here. This is Team Liquid's window. That chunk yeah, on the poke out is going to buy them an opening. There's a couple more wards coming down. It's Fog of War here for FlyQuest. They've got to face check everything and use Rek'Sai for the rest. Does have some vision with that. That is one of the late game importances of that champion is they can play around Fog because of Tremor Sense. And it knows they are not getting baited around the Baron just yet, but it's still Fog of War for everyone else. And TL now is going to actually start it up. Remember, Sona, Tarek in the pit. They can sustain this as long as their mana survives. Jensen and Impact are trying to zone it out. Impact is spotted, though. He's not in a flank position. TPing for a flank on the other side, though. Here comes the play. Baron's too low. Good smite picked up. But there's the engage. Looking for the refight. And it's not going to be enough just yet for the flag quest side. Kennen does massive damage. Galio joins the back line. One for one so far. Kennen for Galio. Revives Viper. He's dropping as well. A double kill now for Smithy. Team Liquid get Baron and the team fight. What a huge victory for Team Liquid. They're chasing down Turtle, too. He's going to get Crescendo. They're going to have a follow through. And Doublelift takes him down. And now it's four versus two with a Baron buff Team Liquid certainly have enough to close down game one. Yeah, I think they can do it here. They're marching down. It's going to be up to a miracle from Pobelter or Santorin. But do they have enough damage to get through all of this healing and shielding? It doesn't seem likely. They're all full health. Lands a paddle start. Decent damage there. The chunk onto Zoe. One more shot. Double finds another three, two and 11 for him. And down go the last turrets. Team Liquid take back FlyQuest. 1-0 start to the series. What a well-fought opener here on Sunday. Team Liquid, I feel like they really needed to make that window work, and they did. Baron buff ending the game before the Infinity Edge comes in. Such a big team fight for them. The timing there on the Baron, just a little bit too quickly for FlyQuest. They didn't have people in position to go for the flanks and try and punish them. Oh, what a good game right there. Team Liquid, they... they Continue to stay aggressive throughout the mid-game. The two team fights they really won by a lot. Getting the first Nexus turret, getting the inhibitor open, gave them a lot of space overall. And they had some really big picks. The crescendo from Doublelift back at like 18 minutes in the mid lane, picked off Bolter. That was absolutely huge. And then again, towards the end right there, catching Turtle, just to make sure they can close out the game. A lot of good plays around that squad. Yeah, and I think you have to give a lot of credit also to Impact in that final fight. You know, the reason that it looked so one-sided towards TL is Impact was actually zoning out almost the entire team. Viper goes in for the flank, but instead of collapsing back to him, he goes forward, he drops the ultimate, drops the Zonias. They have to back off. You cannot fight through that and the carries couldn't actually enter the fight. Impact got the stun onto JJ, so the Galio ultimate couldn't support the Aurelia engage onto the back line. Yep. There was no extra help there, and it collapsed. And of course, Aurelia versus three, you, you keep shielding it, keep healing it, not gonna get those kills. So now for more on how game one shook out, we're heading it off to the State Farm Analyst Desk. Thank you very much, gentlemen. An action-packed first game of the day, but Team Liquid is the team that comes out on top over FlyQuest, showing maybe some of their veteran prowess and experience on this stage in keeping their composure around the global objectives and ultimately finding the right fight for their composition. But again, when we were talking about champion pools at the top of the day and how Champion Select itself might affect this series, we get our first look at it, and Team Liquid takes a page out of the Sonoteric bot lane book. Yeah, and it's an amazing game one draft. We saw it yesterday. You win one game, and now it has to be permabanned. If FlyQuest doesn't play it, they're going to have to ban it every single game from now on. At least probably one of the components. Tarek is the easiest one to get rid of. So it sets a really good tone. However, I don't think it looked that good for them. They were really struggling to make this comp work. FlyQuest found so many windows to destroy it. It was, it was a really weird game because I think they had the right tools to try and beat the comp, and FlyQuest was doing pretty good, and you could see some inexperience on the side of Team Liquid. But then it's also just such a strong comp overall that like they kind of figured it out as the game went along, and then it's, it's very forgiving. Pull Belter lands some huge chunk. Well, we have double heal, and it's not a big deal, and it, it gives you such an advantage in the more neutral stages of the game. Right. Yesterday, I said I wasn't that convinced by the comp. I felt like this game, even though it didn't look it, it convinced me more. So I never felt like Team Liquid was in a position to lose this game. Yes, they lost a fight here and there, but I never felt like they are on the back foot where they're getting pushed into their base and they're getting beat up. Even when FlyQuest got that Baron, Team Liquid was still holding strong and showing that they had control of the map. And it seemed like there wasn't that much that 
FlyQuest could do to beat this comp. The only way that they could is if Team Liquid messed up. So when the, one of these fights, we see that Doublelift makes a huge mistake along with Jensen in the fight that shows, hey, this is not how the comp is supposed to be played. And they learn from that mistake. And then later on in the game, you'll see that they fix it. So here you'll see that Galio does an ulti where Tarek also drops an ulti. And then you'll see that Viper is coming from behind. The only thing Team Liquid needs to do right here is stack on top of each other so that they all get the Tarek ult on top of themselves. But you'll see that Doublelift runs away from the Terra Culti, and Jensen also runs away from the Terra Culti. And at that point, that's not how the comp is played. Yeah, it's one of those things where you're in actually an okay spot here, even though it looks scary. In a typical situation, the average Marksman player is like, GET ME OUT! And that's what they want to do here, but you're fine with the Terra Cult. You have the Kennen and Olaf who are going to zone the rest of their backline, but he flashes right into the Aurelia, <laughs> gets himself killed just as the Terra Cult finishes completing. And now you've lost one of your key damage threats, as well as the fact that Jensen did not receive the ultimate. And this is uh, a bit of inexperience or nerves with the comp, it's hard to say, but this set up a situation where, you know, High is talking about FlyQuest gets the Baron, things are looking much better for them, but they didn't get a monstrous lead with the Baron. It wasn't like an 8,000 gold power play. They didn't crack the base, and so you knew they were going to have to win a couple more fights over the course of that uh, the game. I actually think Core JJ's ulti was super slow there, too. It was pretty slow. You, generally with Tarek, you want to cast your ulti as the fight is about to start, not when the fight is already happening. By the time he cast it, the Galio ulti is already coming down. Kaisa's hitting your Sona on the forfeit already. You want to do that before that happens. Now, Viper picked up a quadra kill in that replay, so I think that that's something to be considered, even though they did lose the game. That's got to feel good in your first outing against Team Liquid, the favorites in this uh, best of five series. It does, and he was up against a Kennen that got a free first blood, so he had mm -hmm. more experience, more gold, and he was still winning that matchup. So I think that the Viper versus Impact story might continue to develop in Viper's favor, and I would have really liked to see Santorin pay a lot more attention to that lane. That Kennen had no flash for quite a few instances, but we never saw the Rek'Sai take a creative path into the mid lane, or into the top lane rather. And if you snowball the Erexia straight, the Irelia straight from the laning phase, then she can go into the team fights and just completely clean house. I mean, to be fair, he was grabbing an Infernal Drake and some of these other uh, objectives, so I think he was still having a, a pretty good influence on the game. Uh, but it was like Kennen with no flash. You have Rek'Sai with flash and then Irelia. That's such an easy. Like, yeah, it's true. The back. But look at how the comps played out at the end. Like that felt like a game where. I don't know what other thing, like if you kill Kennen once in lane, that game doesn't change. The, it's, it's a pretty similar game state, all things considered. I, I want to return well, to the I, point that you were making, Mark, though, about how uh, Team Liquid kind of seemed to discover themselves and how to pilot this composition throughout the course of the game. We're going to take a look at another replay, this one taking place down near the Dragon. Four for zero in favor of Team Liquid, 29 minutes in. Yeah, well, as we get this replay up, hopefully we'll see. Playing on my screen over here. You've got it. I'm watching. I, is it yeah. going to be played, tell, James? I'm watching. It. It. I'll tell you all about it. They're running them down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Ah! Let me roll it back. All right. We're, we're on. Hold on. Back Ready? Watch the conductor. Boom! Right. So right back to the top. This is how Team Liquid wants to play their team comp. Group S5 people cast the ultimate just as the fight is starting. There's nothing that FlyQuest can do here. You do not want to jump the five people that have the Terra Culti. And there's... There's no way they can win that fight when Team Liquid is just I mean, JJ definitely makes a mistake by eing forward and then Galio can't get out and the Terrac Ultimate's still up. But the other question is, how do you force the Terrac Ultimate out if no one ever goes in? And it's, you get in this like weird chicken or the egg situation, which is why this comp is so frustrating to play against. Like, I have not been convinced by anything I've seen played in to this comp to be like, oh, that strategically would have beaten it. I think mm -hmm. you just let the fight stall out. You try not to fight. You force around the objectives and make them come to you, and that way you can start to get some But you mistakes. saw what happened at Baron. Oh, they, they went in. They went in. No, no, no. Later in the game at Baron, Pobelter got landed some great poke. It gets healed up. Pobelter gets hit by one shock blast and a cannon Q, and suddenly they lost control of the map. It's like, that's what makes this comp so disgusting is you want to engage, we have an answer. You want to stall out, we have an answer. I believe me just tweeted at me the other day saying that with Tarek Sona, it's a very interactive game for the enemy team, <laughs> meaning that it's not very interactive. Like, yeah. Even though you land that huge poke, they just heal that up. And if you get pokes, since that's what's going to happen when you trade damage, you can't do anything in return. So as the game gets later and later, it becomes less interactive for one I team. mean, it's strong enough to put your pro arguably two best players of your team into it. And away they don't even normal. look good on and it. They, they look bad on it, and it still crushes. it. Right. Yeah. But, uh, FlyQuest has chosen uh, to stay on red side here for this uh, second game of the series. Of course, we've already talked about uh, the likelihood that they'll ban out one of the two champions. And, or and take it right away, your red side. Take it away. That's a possibility. The question is if they've played it. But... Uh, 
in the in I actually think you can play it without ever playing well, it. Well, yeah, now my best too. <laughs> <laughs> but in the consideration of them banning it out, I want to talk about, in a more standard setup, air quoting that, uh, what, what do we expect these teams to do? And maybe what do they hold over from game one into game two? What do they change? It's a really interesting first game because it almost feels like you could ignore it. Like, the problems that Team Liquid had in this game looked like unfamiliarity with this comp. The problems Flyquist had in this game was playing against that comp. So right. if that comp is completely removed, it almost feels like a fresh slate to the reset. series. Yeah. Right, so Inver earlier in his coach interview said that the, he feels like FlyQuest plays differently from Team Liquid. I don't actually know if that's true. We were looking at some stats earlier, and they both have about the same length of game time. They both like taking to late game. They both like taking team fights. And when you think about that, who really has the edge in a 45-minute game? Team Liquid or FlyQuest? In my money, it's on Team Liquid. And they have an, like an eight and three record after games post 35 minutes, and FlyQuest is seven and six. So if the games keep going like this, where it's super slow in the early game, they're hitting 35-minute marks. I don't think that FlyQuest is going to be able to take it back. It's kind of the classic conundrum. Two teams that play the same style, right? Who's going to yeah. come out on top? Well, quite obviously, the, you know. The world that, champions. That, yeah, exactly. The world champions, the experience. Team Liquid scooped up game one. We'll find out how FlyQuest answer in game two. The series continues after this.